Tonight's presentation is on playtesting for games, kind of best practices, what do we want to see, what works best for us. And it's very difficult for indie devs to do really efficient QA work. It, let's just be honest. No one's got a ton of bandwidth to do that. You're putting QA on top of already being a programmer, designer, artist, audio engineer, marketing lead, social media lead, and everything else that every indie dev has to do. So, uh, so QA starts to become kind of an afterthought, and it can't be. You will hang yourself if you do that as an afterthought. It has to be something you uh, focus on early on. So we're going to be playtesting a bunch of very good games here tonight, and we'll be showing some to the stream as well this evening. But we brought together some of the folks who are demoing games here tonight and getting their games playtested to talk a little bit about what they think uh, is involved in playtesting, what they want to see tonight, how they would like to see bugs reported, and just general practices in QA. And I'm really happy with the uh, panel we have here because it's an across-the-board um, lineup of folks from Indie Dev from a variety of different types of studios and the levels of experience. So let's go ahead and start with Stephanie, if you would introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Stephanie Chergy, and I am the producer at Games That Work. And we brought a VR game tonight to have people playtest. Um, it's very early playtest, so I hope people come and give us some good feedback on that. And one thing you all notice is that we're not having you sign NDAs, even though every game here is pre-release. So uh, we hope you will uh, take that into account. We're not trying to get you to sign your life away, your lives, your extra lives away. But uh, give honest feedback. Um, obviously, these are all in early phase, so you will have bugs. That's the whole point of tonight. So if you uh, tweet about that, we the bugs are expected. So say that they were fun, nice, happy, pretty bugs. Uh, I'm Andrew Greenberg. I'm executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association. I've been in game development since 1990. Tonight I am demoing Fading Sun's Noble Armada, which will be over here on the PCs. And uh, we've had this game in development for a couple days, weeks, something like that. And it's part of our Fading Sun's line, which we've been uh, doing since 95 with the Fading Sun's role-playing game. The Emperor of the Fading Sun strategy game, the Passion Play live action game, and a bunch of other uh, uh, titles as well. Next on my right is... I'm Nar Ninrak. Uh, a lot of people have probably seen me and all the stuff I've been doing lately. I've been really trying to be involved on the streaming side as well as developer side and trying to bridge that gap between them. Ease that communication because a lot of indie developers are just trying to get the game into streamers' hands lately. And streamers are looking for games that they can showcase before everyone else because that gives them that edge of, here's something that only I can show you right now. So I've been working on bridging that gap and communicating between the groups and trying to pull them together. So quite a lot of people have been seeing me bouncing around between. Um, I'm also the owner of Narn Limited. I'm currently working on Elemental Rift. I've also done Man Shuffle, Crystalline Cauldron, to name a couple others. And I, I would say I'm getting close to about the halfway point where most of the core programming is done and it's more cranking out content and features. Hi, uh, I'm Ian Fish from EQ Games. Uh, our company made Road Redemption, which debuted on Steam last month after a couple years in early access. We also worked for uh, Sega and Aspire Media and Gameloft. And if anyone wants a free copy of Road Redemption, just email ian at eq-games.com, ian at eq-games, and we'll send you a copy of that or any other game on our website. Um, so today we are... Uh, we have a game, Super Seducer, out there, which is a live-action game. It is a partnership with a self-proclaimed uh, pickup artist named Richard La Ruina, and the premise of the game is how to talk to girls. And he tells you what is right and what's wrong, and it's kind of a simulator where you approach girls in various situations, and you can do whatever you might want to do in real life, and he'll say, that was bad, that was good, and you get to see it play out. So, you know, uh, it's not on Steam yet, it hasn't even been announced yet, but it's it's you know, a couple months from being finished, it's a pretty playable state, so I'd love to get you guys' opinions on that and watch you play test. So let's start with an easy question. Let's start with you, uh, Ian, on this one. When do you start testing a game? Well, if you're talking about QA, like uh, bug testing, then, you know, you start as early as possible. You want to make sure you get uh, all of the hardest parts of the game done, well tested, you want to build on a strong foundation, so constantly. Um, if you're talking about play testing, you want to make sure that you can do a play test where you're not in the room. That's the only kind of play testing that's really valuable. If you're right there and you're saying, oh, do this, oh, this button does this, this button does this, it's a 
pointless play test because if you think your game is intuitive and yet you have to stand there, then you have an unintuitive game. And if you think your game is intuitive and you've been play tested, then it's not. It's it's unintuitive. You need you you'd be amazed at all the stuff that you take for granted that when you watch a new player, they just don't understand. They don't know what button does what, what the different icons mean, all of that. So we play test when the game is at a state where we can turn on a video camera or turn on bandy cam walk out of the room, come back an hour later, and then watch the footage. That's, that's when we'll start playtesting. And Ari, you want to take that one too? Um, for me, I kind of went with a different approach. I went uh, for Momocon 2014. Uh, it's just weeks before uh, it was actually showcased or playable, I decided to submit for it and just do like a big open whoever's at Momocon can come up and play it and that has changed the game drastically in so many ways and even if I kind of need to stand there to kind of keep an eye on things I could still make sure people could figure out what the controllers were and see how people were reacting seeing their feedback and it has changed the game already into a very different direction one that's giving more depth to the universe giving me better understanding and uh, with all the shows I've been involved with throughout just this year alone, it has been moving, just rocketing in the right direction and growing so much more based on every single feedback I'm hearing from each of these shows. So I would say as soon as a playable build is when I started, um, I, I wouldn't quite say I was able to just walk away the, from the room, but that helped me take such an early position and change completely into a different direction. Yeah, so it's been interesting seeing the answer to this question change over time. So when I started developing games, we were working with a publisher, so we would test internally, so we do our early milestones. We'd have to test each milestone to make sure it was complete before we send it to the publisher. We'd get to alpha, which means feature complete, but a lot of stuff missing, all the big stuff is working. We get that, we test it internally. We get to beta, the stage where we think it's all good, and we know it's not, and then the playtesters are gonna find that all out. And then we send it to the publishers, and they do their playtest, and it keeps going on. Uh, that slowly changed, but the, by the time it got to the general public, the buyers, we expected to maybe do one patch and not have to do anything else to it again. The idea of this early access was really unattainable at that point. And it's been interesting seeing that change where more and more companies are getting the game out to people's hands sooner and sooner. And the weird backlash was that companies are suddenly afraid, oh no, we put it in people's hands, they're complaining about stuff we know will change later. This is going to color people's opinions of the game forever and ever and gonna destroy our sales. And this became kind of a dominant mindset for a little while. And now I love to see where we are now, which is the idea that you put it in people's hands, start getting that feedback, let them talk about it, and then you reveal that next level of polish, and people say, oh, this has been fixed, they're really serious about it, and just keep moving and moving along with that. So the correct answer, of course, to testing is you always test your own stuff, but the other thing, just like Ian said, is nobody can test their own stuff effectively. So I love the idea now where you get it out as early as possible, show that polish, show that developer dedication, and move it along until you're finally ready to really sell it. So um, I also like to test as early as possible. And when I say early as possible, I like to test, or I should say we like to test uh, concepts before we spend a lot of time developing those concepts. So if we can, if we can create a, basically a play test build of just the very simple concept, the very simple mechanic. And we've even had times where we've intentionally stood there uh, and answered people's questions about how to navigate the interface because we weren't testing the interface. We were testing a more core design of the game before we were even implementing the interface. Um, so yeah, when I say I like to test as early as possible, like really testing the mechanics before you spend a lot of time building them. And whether you have a, like, a digital game testing them or you're testing them with pen and paper or uh, some some other some other way that you can create this very simple prototype uh, without spending a lot of time building the game uh, that will prevent you from wasting a lot of time going down a direction that may not have been a good direction before you were even ready to find out about bugs, uh, just finding out about whether or not those concepts are fun to play. So that's that's when I like to start testing. 
I love that idea. Dove, tweet that out. Games that work. We test games before they exist. <laughs> I think that's a great, uh, that's, that's probably the best answer I've heard to that question ever. So I'd love to continue with you, Stephanie, because you guys do testing in a, for a variety of different reasons and a variety of different stages. So you talked about concept testing, prototyping, testing out the mechanics. I know you use user testing, feasibility testing, Oh, the good old days of having to make sure computers would actually work with the things that we tested, run it under a different million different machine combinations. So can you talk about some of the different types of tests that you do? So uh, let me think. Um, so one that came to mind uh, in my last question was uh, we had a project um, with a client, and I, I said that the interface wasn't even ready yet. Um, but we, this was a digital test that we had, and um, I basically asked, acted as a dungeon master, even though it wasn't a dungeon-based game, while well, Jesse <laughs> took notes for me. Um, and so we would sit a single person in front of the computer, and we would let them try to figure it out, uh, what they were supposed to do, just like the goal of the level. And whenever they got stuck, I would stop drop, start dropping hints. And that let us know what information they needed. So we weren't expecting them to have all the information at that point. We were trying to find out what information do they not have to get through this level. Uh, one of the really valuable things that came from doing that is we found out our levels were way too complicated. And we started out with five levels, and we ended up breaking those five levels into two to five sub-levels. And that was, that was one of the really huge benefits we got from that. And because we went in with a design that was very modular, we were able to change the level and, and present it to them in a different way so that they could see the, the problem that they, were, that they had to solve differently. Um, and so that was, that was just having a modular test was really valuable to us. Uh, we've also done a lot of, uh, not, not as much recently, but in the past we've done a lot of paper and pencil uh, board games and card games that have then later developed into digital games. And uh, with a lot of those, there, those were uh, for schools, for a business school in Austin. And the client knew the subject matter that he wanted to teach, and he knew the concepts he wanted to teach. And we were the game developers. We didn't know we didn't know the business education side. That's so true we were, of most game developers. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he knew exactly what he wanted to teach, and we were trying to build a game to teach it. And because we had this simple uh, board game prototype, he was able to play it before we spent a lot any time coding it. And because he was able to play it, he was able to give us feedback on the fact that it wasn't exactly teaching the concepts he was intending, and we were able to work with him to change the game. And at first, we didn't even understand what it wasn't uh, communicating or what it was he wanted to teach that we weren't teaching because we didn't understand the business concepts. Uh, but after working with him, uh, we ended up creating a, a much stronger game. And if we had already spent a lot of time coding that, it would have been much harder to go back and redo that work. Excellent. And NR, I know you're doing something I like to do, which is live streaming play tests. And that's a whole new area. So talk about that. Um, I've, I've done a little bit about it. In fact, uh, one of the most popular uh, non-VOD video on my channel has been a uh, glitch where Crispy B's uh, Snow Rush was uh, not quite reading in the velocity it was supposed to, so it would suddenly shoot off, bounce all over the place, and because this was causing him to hit himself, it was bouncing in all sorts of crazy directions, and it was just a really funny clip of just watching a little pig turn into a snowball and bounce it himself all over it, like, a very, very fast pace of ping pong. Uh, so sometimes just showing what happens when some of these codes happen creates great moments that uh, the channel is becomes known for. And it shows how these things aren't just as simple as, oh, you want two player. OK, here's a little plug in done. It, there's so many other details and so many other layers going on that build up to make it as seamless as possible. And when we're doing our job right, it's we make it look very easy, but the better we do, the easier it makes, and it really pays off in that last regard. 
And Ian, tonight you're primarily looking to uh, watch the user experience and how easily they get into the game. Can you talk about what you're actually going to be watching for without cluing them in to what they shouldn't be showing off? Uh, yeah, well, basically we're just going to see how people play the game, what they like, what they don't like, what they click on, how often they click, all those little things. Uh, you know, this game is a lot simpler than games we made in the past, so... You know, the general uh, things we're looking for is like, do they understand the concepts? Do they understand the UI? Do they understand the controls? This one, we've actually, uh, from past, t past playtesting, we've torn out a lot of, you know, overly convoluted UI elements, made it very simple. Uh, so really, we're just testing to see how long the people play it. Do they seem like they're enjoying themselves? Uh, do they, are they clicking on all the different options? And then, you know, talking to them after. And also getting their opinion on the, the political aspects of the game, which obviously there are. You know, because it's it's about picking up girls. So we want to get some reactions to that as well. So you talked about a very important thing, checking where people are clicking, where they're watching. Now, at a big company, this is all automated. All these metrics are collected. Nobody has to just stand over someone's shoulder. You've got this whole spreadsheet at the end of the day, and you can tell everything that the tester or user did. Uh, I don't have those uh, tools at my disposal. I don't think you do. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a game company have like an organized either QA or playtesting process. You don't have like heat maps like you'll have at like Google or Facebook. It's, it's a lot more just, you know, watching people play. Um, you know, if like with, with, with video game companies, it's like if they're even doing that, if they're even recording the playtesting and not being there hunched over the guy's shoulder, you know, that to me is like, all right, best practices. You know, that, that's, that's what you want to see. Yeah, those playtester heat maps are really cool when you do get your hands on them. Those are a lot of fun, but they're out of the uh, out of the reach of most indie devs. So, NR, let's talk specifically. You talked about how you've changed parts of your game from having watched the playtest. Can you give some examples of how that worked? Um, I would say the biggest change and one that was immediately loved from the very next showcasing I did was there were a lot of camera issues in my very, very first showcasing at MomoCon 2014. And then for Siege... That year, which was about three or four months, I think. Uh, yeah, after, yeah, about four months. May to October, yeah, yeah. About four months. Uh, this, the judge alone became the single most popular character just by having him kind of direct the camera and cueing the players. Uh, this character has died, and waving little flags signifying that. Um, and now the interactions with uh, some of the mechanics have taken him a whole step further. There's a big thing I am working on right now that I'm not saying any details until it's done, but I'm really excited about it. And it's, all I can say is to for everyone to keep an eye out because I will be having that done soon, and it'll add a whole extra depth compared to other brawler games because I have this judge that only became because I was having camera issues that I wasn't aware of until I started bringing it to a show floor and hearing that feedback. So, Stephanie, your team has done probably more user experience testing than almost anyone. I'm thinking specifically of uh, Brush Up. You had to work with a really unique audience for that. So how do you play test a children's game so you know it works for that audience? So um, actually for Brush Up, and this that's coming to my mind right now is not ex exactly user testing, but we did uh, recruit a lot of kids to play the game early on. Uh, we uh, got an NIH grant to do a study uh, with kids to see if the game, uh, it's a toothbrushing game for those of you who are not familiar, uh, if the toothbrushing game could change the children's actual toothbrushing behavior. And because we had a grant, we had money to put into the tests, and we were able to uh, pay the parents who had their kids participate in this test. Um, I believe this was this was a while ago. I believe we had the kids come in and they they played the game once in our studio, and then they took the game home and played it at home. And we got we got feedback from. Um, some parents saying the siblings were crying because they wanted to play the game. <laughs> or It's a good game when you cause inter-family uh, dispute, yes. inter-family dispute. Um, so, but that was actually, I think, before we did as much uh, usability testing like as compared to what we do now. Um, we have since also, for Brush Up, done more user testing for parents who are signing up through the interface. And for that, what I did 
uh, was I created a very, very simple mock-up uh, interactive prototype. And I just walked around Decatur Square offering a Starbucks drink to parents who would just play through the interface. And because our, our interface at the time, we, there were improvements we wanted to make to it, but we didn't want to rely on what we thought the improvements should be. We wanted to actually take the improvements and the questions that we had and go put them in front of people. And we got, I got, I, one thing I like to do uh, when, when doing one-on-one -on -one testing like that is always ask them to tell me what they're thinking. Because they'll, a lot of times they'll get to a screen and they won't be saying anything, but they're thinking a lot in their brain while they're looking at the screen. And unless you say, hey, can you let me know what you're thinking? And just think out loud. You're not going to get that information. But as soon as they start telling you, okay, I think I'm supposed to do this, or I'm looking at this and this is what I think about it, you get a lot of feedback that you wouldn't get. And even like even from a heat map, you wouldn't get this type of feedback of what they're actually thinking. Maybe kind of like, oh, well, they had their cursor here, so they were looking at this. But you don't know what they were thinking about it. Um, but yeah, putting it out in front of the parents and just getting them to talk through what was going through their heads was really helpful. No, I love that. And that's something that you do in a live stream play test because you're talking the whole time you're play testing because you have a live stream audience. You're capturing yourself doing that, but capturing uh, uh, testers doing that is great. Oh, and actually, um, like also to, to recruit kids uh, early on, we just asked our friends to bring their kids in. <laughs> do you record the testers thinking through it or do you just write, take down notes? I've just taken down notes, but recording is a good idea. I would... I feel like I would have to let them know I was recording them, and it might make them uh, nervous about being recorded. But you would get a more accurate uh, record of what they were saying, because you, you do miss things when taking notes down, especially if... It, it's better if you have someone running the test and someone else taking notes, but sometimes that's not always an option. I love the idea of not just testing the game. You're testing the entire interface that gets them from learning about the game to buying the game and then finally handing it off to someone to play the game, essentially. Well, to be fair, we were... So um, we did have some metrics uh, in Brush Up thanks to Jesse in the back. <laughs> um, we knew how many people were viewing each page. And so we saw drop-offs in certain pages and we wanted to solve that. So... We did have metrics available to us that just basically let us know, hey, there's a problem here. And then we took that information and went out to test to solve the problem. Well, let's continue on that vein, because that's actually one of the most important parts of play testing, which we didn't realize early on and since have, where players drop off, where they stop playing the game, where they sit and watch and don't do anything. That's become one of the key aspects of play testing. Where are the hangups? Where are the obstacles? Where are the blocks for players? So when you are testing for that, what do you do? Obviously, there's one metric, just where do they turn it off and get up and walk away? But what are you looking for when you're looking for those kind of blocks? I mean, really, you want to know why they're stopping, right? So in our case, um, we, we made some inferences looking at the pages where they were dropping off. We made some initial inferences and then tried to solve those. But then in addition to that, like we, we can only make so many assumptions and some of those are gonna be wrong. So once we made our guesses, then that's why we had to get them out, the changes out in front of people and getting that feedback, we were able to make more changes beyond our initial guesses. What about you, NR? So when people play your game, usually they at least play through one fight. But do you have some sort of test in place? Do you track when people actually stop mid-fight for whatever reason? And what have you learned? Um, I actually ran into that problem uh, just experimenting the default setting I was using at a show, uh, especially with all the things going around. That becomes a much more, did I really hook them or are they just kind of looking for a time filler? And the metric I've mostly been watching for me personally has been they finish the match. Or they wanted to play another match. And I've been seeing that go up more and more. Um, like at this year's Siege, there was one guy who I think at least went through 50 matches. Uh, so, and he was really psyched about the character that I always cosplay at Momocon, uh, Siren. And it, it was just really great seeing he's really connecting with it. He's really loving it. And the energy he was bringing to it, 
uh, the energy, there were these two little kids at Southern Fry that they bring to it. Once they, they really get into it, they're bringing other people in, and it, it starts to just become this ripple effect of there's a group of people here, and they're wanting to keep on playing, and that the curiosity brings them in, and now we've got more people playing, and people are wanting to keep on playing instead of passing controller on and going to something else. It has been the most important metric, but I would say in order to improve that, it was finding that sweet spot of how to set up just those default settings because the reality is once we launch, about 10% at best will even look at your options or change your settings until they're really hooked within and then they start exploring the game. And even then, I think it only goes up to about 15%, 20%, unless it starts to get to a really big thing like Smash Brothers level where the competitive community will go through and analyze every little detail. So let me just make sure the person playing 50 plus matches was one of our volunteers shirking duty. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Just making sure. Uh, so Ian, you've got your testing and obviously you want to know where people run into obstacles, but you mentioned before you're worried about kind of the optics on this game. Will it offend people? Is that a thing you're actually going to be able to track? Uh, no. Um, well, what we can do is we can get people's opinions. Um, but, you know, we want to hit that spot where we're offensive enough to generate controversy, <laughs> but then, you know, because it's all about visibility, right? With, you know, 100 games releasing every week or 200 every week, you know, you do whatever you can to get visibility. So, you know, on its face, this game might seem offensive to someone, which is great. But then once they dig deeper into it, uh, what we found is people think that it's not offensive and that uh, a lot of women are like, every guy should play this game because it teaches them not to be a jerk. So, um, you know, we just want to make sure we get those reactions. We don't want to go too far one direction or the other. We don't want to make it too tame and we don't make it too offensive. So that's the goal. Are you going to play test the opposite version? We have a female using the same lines on a male? Uh, we would, um, but the demographics of Steam really don't support <laughs> that. Uh, you know, I, I think a, a gay version would probably be great on Steam, but um, females, uh, you know, if you look at just Steam demographics, it's a very small part of Steam, which is not to say females don't play a lot of games. They do, but it seems mostly it's free-to-play stuff, and when they spend money, it's microtransactions, not buying full-priced games. And this is obviously... We're talking about generalities, demographics, any individual might be completely different. All right, well, let's uh, end this with a question about a QA plan. One of the hardest things for an indie dev to sit down and find time to put together is an actual plan for testing. So Ian, as someone who's put out a number of games, are you able to do QA plans? And if so, what do you put in them or do you just kind of have an idea? Uh, well, we just kind of test as we go. You know, anytime we release, obviously, before we release something to the public, if it's on early access, for instance, we do uh, some QA passes internally. Um, but in terms of a plan, you know, we just want to make sure that we're testing throughout, that we don't uh, go weeks and weeks on working on some big feature before making sure the game's playable, making sure that it works, and all of that. Uh, so... Every company I've ever worked for has kind of just kind of been that. You just have these QA people testing every day, you know, making sure the new commits didn't cause any new bugs. Um, and with a smaller team, we don't have a dedicated QA staff, so we just kind of say, okay, you got a QA test today, you got a QA test today, that, that kind of thing. And I think uh, Ian brought up another great point. Whenever you add anything new in, you've got to test out all kinds of things. You have no idea what that halo effect will have impacted. You make one change in the code, and you never really know where all the, uh, the issues might come up. So about a UNR, what's your QA plan? Um, since I'm more taking a show presentation and taking each show as kind of like a milestone progression... I have a group of volunteers that are also helping staff the booth, and we're spending at least two days. I try to go for three or four sessions with them one-on-one, -on -one, but at least two days as a full group where we're just playing the game. So it gives the people who are helping the booth uh, familiarity with it so that they can actually talk about it from experience, what they're liking about it, how the characters work. They're spending time with each individual character. They're spending time on each individual stage, giving them that full rundown. And I'm also using those sessions to see, okay, so this is what they're leaning towards, what they're gravitating for, for kind of getting that whole feel. And I do... This year I did a big session for Momocom because that was my big first one for the year and there were all those other ones, but my other big session was for DreamHack because that was a much more competitive uh, convention than all the other ones and I really want to make sure 
all of the progression I did in that direction was paying off and moving in the right direction. So getting the helpers who are helping the booth that I'm going to be showcasing it gives them the experience and gives me testing in all sorts of ways that they're trained they're trying to do and play the game and outsmart each other and it, it lets them have some fun and um, learning how players are really gravitating towards certain strategies and whether they're broken or if it's just a good strategy that they like they've earned the process to think it through and it pays off well but it has its own risks and rewards um, it's teaching me a lot even before it's in front of all the audiences and letting them actually play the game and experience all, everything. And I already have done a lot of my QA, so I feel very safe in that experience as well. Excellent. So I'll throw in one thing I'd recommend being a QA plan for most uh, indie devs, and that be your cheat codes. We add cheat codes to games specifically to facilitate play testing, not to make it a more amusing game for the uh, players. So it certainly helps but it's really there for the, uh, for the testers. So it's a good idea early on to figure out what cheat codes you're gonna want in the money cheats, damage cheats, armor cheats, uh, invulnerability cheats, whatever, to do that early on and have that locked into the code, commented in so you know what's going on and ready to move forward for testing throughout. So just one thing you might wanna think early in the QA plan. So uh, Games at Work has done some real QA plans in the past. Can you talk about what goes into your QA plans? So and you all think of questions because that's next. Yeah, we've worked with uh, some third-party QA companies and have had to provide them materials because, one, they were remote, uh, so we weren't going to be right there to answer questions. And also, they had never seen the game before when we first gave it to them. Um, so when you give your game to a third-party company, they will test it for usability as well as for bugs. And so they'll... They'll run, they'll take their testers. So there will be one head tester uh, who um, is kind of just running the test and he's got testers working for him. And they'll test for usability first when they're still new to the game and unfamiliar with it. Uh, but we provide to the head tester, uh, we provide the cheat codes so they can jump to any level. We provide walkthroughs so they know what is expected behavior in every level and like what the paths are. So uh, especially for Enemy of Reason, um, we had to provide a lot of documentation to the testers so that when they were playing through, if they ran into something, they would know what their options were um, to um, traverse that narrative or if they were supposed to be able to get out of it and they were actually stuck, um, and how to start the level over. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We can reach you with the microphone. We swear we can. Whoa, hey! There's a lie. You can walk up here, Michael. Hey, hey, look at that. I'm coming your way still. I'm just doing this to get back to the pizza. Yeah, I, I just, you said that you sent, um, like, what you guys expected you know, like what, what the expected results would you, you sent that beforehand? Yeah, we sent the um, testing company like what we expected to happen. Yeah. For the QA lead. Yeah, so okay. the, the testers wouldn't they know what was supposed they, to happen. Okay, all right, yeah, and that's but, what I was the QA lead would have that, would yeah. need that. So the QA lead, so that they could say, hey, I found this bug, and the QA lead could look at the notes that we sent. And so within their team, they could figure out if that was supposed to happen or if it seemed weird and could report it to us how they saw fit. And I've actually done something similar. So something I've done for myself when early in design, uh, like they write the concept, do the concept testing, I would actually write a narrative of what the player is doing from the moment they start the game till they're getting into the play of what they're doing, what they're pressing, what they're doing, what, what I want them to be experiencing before I design the game. So I've got a sense if what I've been putting together is actually fun. And then I can send something like that to uh, the test team to ensure that what I have envisioned is actually something that they're experiencing. Is that like a prose form of user actually flow? prose, because you can tell I came out of the writing side of it. Yeah, I think I'm the only person I know who does this. Dev does that. Oh, okay. Wow, darn, so much for my uniqueness. But I found that to be very helpful for just showing, uh, the, again, QA leads, the publishing testers, what I had in mind. And if it's not meeting that, that's really good feedback. But I don't know that we've ever used it in QA, so. All right. It, it is great. For, I love it for design. 
Is this going to be fun? I said, all right, I'm tired of writing this. It's not going to be fun for people to play either. Let me do something else. All right, so questions. We have questions from Mixer. Do we have questions from the audience? And obviously, the cord will reach. Or, Dove, do you have a comment on the... Uh, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We can reach you. We've proven that now. The prose is also pretty useful for pitching. I've actually always used it after we've gotten <laughs> after we've gotten that first payment. So that's interesting. I've got to do that too. Yeah, because uh, that is something that the the people who are funding can understand better than your design doc a lot of the time. And they're not going to read through a design doc, but well written prose they will read through. All right, do we have any questions coming on from the mixers? Excellent. All right, uh, yes, Ron Williams and probably one of our other most experienced people with the QA side of thing. So when you were first getting your feet wet with testing, user testing, and all that stuff, what were one of those things that you did that was like, looking back on it, a face palm kind of moment, something that you wouldn't do anymore? Stupidest moments in testing from anybody? I'm trying to remember. Um, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, believing people's feedback when they're in front of you or you invite them over or, or anything like that, like taking their feedback to heart is a bad idea because uh, they're generally not being honest. Well, so, you know, you send your, you send your game to, uh, to a YouTuber, a random streamer, which we do a lot. We'll say, hey, random YouTuber with, you know, 10,000 subscribers, 5,000 subscribers. So you just test this game, record it, record yourself playing it, make it an unlisted video, and, uh, you know, so we can watch your feedback or whatever. And, you know, that's how you get an honest opinion. People say, this sucks. You know, I'm done after 10 minutes. But then you bring a person over to your house, you know, a random stranger, not a friend, and you sit them down and they'll play for two hours. And they'll be like, this game's awesome. You know, and it's even worse at conventions if you're standing over somebody like, what do you think of my game? Oh, yeah, it was great. Best game ever. But then that's not an honest answer. It's not very helpful because then you release it to the public and you get 50% review scores. So believing playtesters' opinions on the quality of my game is probably a facepalm moment. And I would say, depending on who is testing your game, like if your buddy's testing your game, I mean, maybe it depends on your buddy, but they don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, if you find a random stranger to go through the game, they're still probably going to sugarcoat things. Um, but I guess it also kind of, I guess, depends on if you're testing for if it's fun or if you're testing for what you think they're supposed to do or what you want them to do versus what they actually do, because then that can't be faked. But um, I would probably say for me, just everything with that very first game, like you're so starry eyed of, yes, I'm finally making a game. I'm, I'm, this is all awesome. And even when you're showing it to feedback, showing it in front of people who are fellow students, colleagues, friends, so forth, like had mentioned, they're going to sugarcoat it a bit, and you're, of course, just going to kind of go with the flow. But getting through that first game, and then you can finally go back and get yourself separated from it and start looking back and just looking at all of the stuff from that very first game that you just go, oh, what was I thinking? Why did I think this was good? Why did I think this was fun? But we all go through that, and it, it's part of the mystifying effect of getting started and then getting experience to be able to go back and say, no, that that wasn't fun. What was I thinking? I think early on, I just realized what it was. Um, testing too much with yourself and not with other people uh, because you get to know your game so well uh, that you take the same path every time. The game becomes much easier for you than it is for someone else who's playing it the first time. And so early on, I think that was that was the big mistake I remember making because I, I gave it to someone else and the game was super, super hard for them. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm too used to my game. Needless to say, every tester ever said my game was the best ever was exactly right and got an A on their test. But uh, one thing that I made a mistake with very early on, I think I've learned from this one, is not giving outside testers clear rules on how to report bugs to me. So one of the secrets as when you're a tester is that you want to give the bug report to someone in an understandable way, but not just that. In the easiest way for that person to reproduce the bug, you just tell them the game crashed. You tell them how you got it to crash with as few steps as possible. And uh, the best way to do it is one, two, three, four, five. Do this, do this, do this, do that, and it crashes. And it does it every time I do it, or it does it most of the time, and I don't know what step in here is making it a random, a seemingly random function. Me, we know it's not a random function within the computer. Uh, and 
when you're an indie dev and you're getting anyone to test you can, they will just send back that bug report. Game crashed. And it's like, right, well, okay, that was a big help. Thank you. So, yeah, giving clear rules uh, to the testers. All right, so we've got a question from Mi Whoa. I don't want that question from Mixer, apparently. Mi question from Mixer. Yes. Uh, what's his name? Renaud D. Marshall asks, um, what are some best practices for finding playtesters? Good question. For best question, you win M&Ms. Come here and get them. Come get them. All right, anyone want to take that one? Yeah, uh, well, you know, honestly, the GGDA is pretty good. Uh, you know, you post a message on the GGDA Facebook group, and like all things on game development, if you want help, you make it easy as possible for them. You give them your address, you give them the time, you tell them about the game, you tell them about your company, and you give them your phone number, you give them your email address, and they contact you. Every time we've tried it, we've gotten plenty of playtesters that way. Another good way is uh, sending to random YouTubers, again, with low levels, low numbers of subscribers. Uh, you know, the big YouTubers are obviously never going to pay attention to you because, you know, they get you know, 100 key, key, uh, Steam keys a day, but you go to someone with like 500 subscribers, they feel very honored to be able to play your game before anyone else's. And you say, please give me a great, uh, you know, as honest opinion as you can. It doesn't help for you to be nice, be mean. Please be mean. And that's that's been pretty effective. And the GGDA Facebook group responds immediately when you say, please be mean, doesn't it? Yeah. They're, they're too nice. Anyone else have best practice on finding uh, For me, it's more of, I just do, since I'm, I'm focusing on conventions, I go through and just let people play. And the ones I see who are really understanding the mechanics are the ones that I'm going to keep a closer eye on. Then I'm going to st start asking them some questions of like, how did you feel about this? And start to see if they understand what they're doing at, on a mechanical level of explaining, okay, I did this process, which caused this, which caused this, and see if they can even understand what they're talking about. Because I know when they report the bug, they're going to need to explain it step by step by step and be able to understand exactly what it was that they were doing. However, you don't want to focus on just having experts either. You got to have a few just on the side that are never playing it for both expert level and for I am the noob. I've never played a game before type so that they can tell you this is my fresh experience while the expert gamers can say, OK, this is working. I haven't played this game yet, but I'm liking this feature and this flow. And that way you have little waves at each extreme and you can make sure that both new players and expert levels can understand exactly what they're doing. But you want to bring a few in at each and every little step. And to heck with YouTubers. Mixer casters are the way to go. <laughs> Remember, Ian, our host tonight, said contact him. He'll send you a copy of the game. You can yep. play it on your channel. You can report the bugs to him. You can VOD the test and show it to him. Exactly. Right. That's what I do love about live streaming tests is you have the full test recorded, which yep. is uh, an absolutely wonderful uh, feature. So for my games, we're generally going for more grognard audience. I know most of you don't know that term. We're looking for old school gamers who love strategy games and love to complain. So they actually make wonderful testers. Thank you all. All the grognards out there. The issue is, if we're going to hand it off to someone, we also want someone who has no life, so they actually have time to test it, which is great for grognards like myself. Uh, so uh, in summation, find bitter people who have no lives, and they're the best testers. <laughs> So we've actually had to recruit a lot of kids for our testing. And since no one else has talked about that, I'm going to tackle that one. Um, so we've reached out to schools, uh, but I don't think we've reached out to public schools. And that's probably because they have a lot of rules and regulations they have to follow and paperwork. Uh, but we have gotten testing through um, like the P Padilla School. Um, they're a private school that's near us. Uh, we've gotten testing through the boys and girls clubs in the area. Um, and some of this is just like networking through people we know that work at those places. Um, we've also gone to festivals with our games. Uh, there was a health focused festival up in Gwinnett and we took a version of our game up there and they were really happy to have us just be, especially being health oriented. Um, but all the kids that came by, we got them to play our game and we got testing on the spot there. So for us, it's about finding places where kids will be and um, where we'll have like, they'll, they'll have free time and be wanting to play games and um, have access to them. And might there be a student group here that would be a good source for testers? Why, who might that be? 
So yeah, the Georgia Tech VG Dev folks, for anyone who has a studio here, talk to Sean about doing tests over at Georgia Tech. Those kids don't know anything about technology, but they can at least mess up a game. All right, we've got a question over here. I think there's a question over there. Oh, Georgia State? Yeah. But the, the, well, the Georgia State professor stormed out of here, so I don't think we're going to be working with... Where did Jim go, anyway? Oh, well. Yeah, we know how to get in touch with them. All right, question and over here. I think we have a question over here, too, we'll as grab, well. We'll afterwards. grab live audience, then we'll go back. We just did the mixer question. That's good. This was kind of a follow-up for the... Uh, not reaching out to public schools. I was curious if you partnered with any uh, colleges... For, with their education department to try and reach out to public, I mean, to reach out to public schools. Sorry, what was the question? So, college college education programs usually have uh, access to uh, K through twelve. We have not, and that's a good idea. And I would like to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> Dove, Secretary Dove, get to work. So, take notes for me, Dove, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right, mixer question. <laughs> uh, two quick things. First of all, thank you, Luftmacht, for tipping us $10. Yay! Yay! And then Brian Miller asks... Um, Is that that fat mill? <laughs> do you survey your new playtesters before and or after playing your games? Any kind of surveys, before or after surveys? We have done surveys. Um, they're okay. It depends on what kind of information you're trying to find. Um, I, I love being able to talk to playtesters in person, but it's not always possible. Um, but we have done surveys for like testing a large number of people um, through either Mechanical Turk or when our clients have just provided a lot of people um, available to test. And... Creating the survey questions can be tricky because you don't want to lead them and you want don't want to find useless yes or no information. Um, so we've kind of done the combination of like survey monkey is really good because it has a lot of options. Like it lets you like sort from favorite to least favorite and it's on a scale of one to ten, and then you can add comment boxes of well, why did you like this? And you can have branching. So survey monkey is a really good tool. Um, but you, you want to be able to write good questions if you're going to do a survey and realize that the information you're going to have is uh, limited and that it's a lot of data, but maybe not a lot of information about the data. Uh, I've actually done that more for tabletop games than I have for PC games. I have done it for the computer games. But uh, when we would do role-playing game tests for the World of Darkness stuff and for Fading Suns, we would do that. We would, we would ask people their favorite games, uh, what type of characters they like to play, and then at the end, what did they like best, what didn't they like about it, because again, it's very tough to capture metrics on a tabletop game. Uh, what do they think of the mechanics, etc. So I have done that, and I, I've done it on um, for computer games too, but that was more kind of just to get a sense of the testers. What other games do you like? Do you like strategy games, that sort of thing? So uh, if you're doing tabletop, I strongly recommend it. We got great feedback that way. I haven't done surveys since Crystalline Cauldron, so I'm look, thinking back to 2007. The reason I didn't like surveys too much is it, instead of a bell curve of the results, it ends up being a valley where you've got a lot of your results on either extreme, and that seemed counterintuitive to me instead of getting a more bell curve where there's a centralization towards the middle and extreme cases are more of a minority instead of about 90% of your results, and that really threw off my results because I wasn't seeing the shift as well as it's either thumbs up or thumbs down, and gaming is so, so deep and has so many bells and whistles and mechanics going on that a, a yay or nay just isn't enough to really work with, and that's why I stopped doing them instead of just been going to shows and studying the players while they're playing. All right, two more questions, then we get into the play testing. Do we have a question in the back of the room? No. Oh, okay, fine, be that way. You got a comment? Sort of. You can talk into the microphone. We can even reach you, Joe. <laughs> Puzzles by Joe, Mr. Clutter himself. 
Thank you. Um, it was actually for um, on Nar's comment. At, at one point, <clears throat> you seemed to imply you were doing a survey that was on a gradient, but they were still going to either extreme. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So the comment I did want to make on that, and then you switched to this yes or no thing. That's why I asked. Oh, yeah. Anyways, the comment I wanted to make is actually, I view that as a good thing. Because if you, I want to actually make a love me or hate me game. If you get either the bell curve or most people sort of in the middle without the extremes, you've made a shitty game that nobody's really going to play. Everybody's just going to go, eh, that game's okay. But if you really make a polarizing game where certain people love it and other people can't stand it, then I think you've got a shot at having a better game. So that's all. What if they're only at one end of the scale? All right, one last question. Do you have anything else for Mixer? The voice of Mixer is beat. Renaud D. Marshall asked, um, are there any genres or types of games that don't lend themselves to play testing? That's an easy answer. They all need play testing whether they lend themselves to it or not, so it doesn't matter. Everything needs testing. Some can be harder to really get user testing on. So classic example of going back to what something Ian said about having to not necessarily trust the feedback is that play testers don't know their issue. So you hear, Pal the Paladin's been nerfed. The Paladin's been nerfed. It's not that it's weaker or stronger. It's just that they're not having as much fun playing it. That's the real complaint. So you have to hear what the real complaint is under the specific issue that they, that they present, when you're, especially when you're doing uh, the user side of it. So what do they actually, you really need to dig into some of these or evaluate what they're doing to see um, what is the real issue the tester is having. Yeah, what does the mixer guy have in mind? Did he have an idea? What was he talking about? She can test kids brushing their teeth. I mean, that's... <laughs> You can test anything at that point. I mean, you can't even get kids brushing their teeth, and she can test them. I mean, maybe if your game only appealed to a very, very niche audience, and you literally, like, a feedback from a wider audience would be useless, maybe that doesn't lend itself to playtesting, but otherwise I can't think of it. It's hard to test this face-slapping mechanism in uh, mechanic in Ian's game. <laughs> I will say story-driven games, it, it, they are tougher to test because in order for them to get the context, you can't just... Oh, let's jump to level nine and see how that's working. You have to, they're, they're going to get lost. Look, look at any RPG. If you jump straight to disc three, back when we used to do multiple discs, or jump to second to last dungeon, they're not, not going to have a clue what's going on. They're not going to understand their characters. So that those experiences are going to be much tougher to test. So, but I, they're going to be much more important to test to make sure that players are understanding how to get to those end results. But... I would say story-driven ones are going to be much tougher, at, and they're going to you're going to have to set more time aside for it. I'm very interested in Ron's. Do you have a comment on that one, Ron? I'd love to hear this one. Just understanding what it is that you're trying to test also makes a big difference. I mean, yeah, even, <laughs> see the voice of IGN. See on, see on the uh, actually in the stream. The voice of the International Game Developers Association, Atlanta. Okay, Ron Williams. Williams. So yeah, just understanding what it is that you're trying to test also makes a big difference, right? There's a difference between, you know, the fun factor versus usability versus replayability and all these other different things that you can take into account. So if you're really taking the time to understand upfront, set specific goals and outcomes of what it is that you're trying to get out of that play test, it makes it a lot easier to try to structure your plan for testing um, around what it is that you do. One of the things that I've experienced is going into a test just to get people to play it and get any kind of feedback aimlessly, it kind of null and voids the entire thing. You want to have some kind of specific, like, like you were saying earlier, have some kind of specific outcome in mind of what you're expecting to happen and then see how close or how far you do deviate from that expected outcome. Yeah, that's great. Great input. Okay, thanks to everybody for the questions. Uh, we are going to keep the little stream going as we start testing out games. We've got one last thing. I'm going to keep you all here so we can applaud, folks. Got to go put meter in my car. We have three of our Siege uh, winners here. Uh, and I wanted to recognize them here. Yes, you have checks. I'm going to give you the checks later. But I'm going to get you to come up and say hi on stream. So first, so at Siege, we give out a number of awards for indie, get, indie games. They're the Sylvie Awards we have. We have a nice silver. Do we actually give out a trophy this time, uh, Joe? No. No? 
<laughs> Not even certificates. Not even certificates. I've got them tonight. All right. <laughs> So at our December 12th holiday party, <laughs> we will have the Sylvie Awards to actually give to you. Half the recipients of your award. Half the recipients, the right half or the left half of them. All right, so uh, first of all, uh, we'll get you up on, up on camera just to recognize you. Winning in art was Aether's Child. So who from Aether's Child wants to come up here and uh, be recognized? And while he's wandering on up here, yay! Sure. I don't think I'm on. I don't see my on. Hello? Yeah, just stand. That's the stream, so be somewhere that they can oh, see you on camera. Really so, right, there's your mark. Uh, all right, for the Siege Choice Award, voted on by attendees, Sinker by Gearhead for Hire LLC, Robert Waller representing. <laughs> Woo! And finally, my for favorite Best game in from last show, year. Woo! Uh, Twin Cop, which you can get right, actually you can get uh, Sinker right now on Steam as well. Check, check out both Sinker and, he, and Twin Cop. And he still needs some reviews. I thought, oh, okay. Sin Sinker needs reviews. Finite Reflections and representing Finite Reflections is Carter K. Kinney, yay! yay. So thank you all very much. Yes, I have your checks here tonight to give you, but no trophies. So, anything you want to say, Joe? No, just give the money. Give him give the money. <laughs> All right, so we're uh, just on. just awesome, actually. So I mean, really, I was very happy with the seats this year. Uh, Chip Sylvie wanted to be here today. Is feeling a little under the weather, so That's he couldn't make it. Sophie. Also, shout out to Ron Jones, who's just awesome doing the um, the indie cluster each year, and uh, actually throughout the year at other places, etc. Um, that's it. All right. Well, thank you all very much. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start by showing off, I think, your VR title. So we're going to go ahead and get set up. Hold on, all of you on the stream. Keep watching, and we're going to go ahead and get set up for the playtest.